Chapter 12 Dina stared out into the early morning darkness as they rode home in silence. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't keep the horrifying scene in the house on Fear Street out of her mind. Again and again she saw the ransacked living room, the woman lying sprawled on the floor, the knife, the blood. She wanted to tell her parents everything. Maybe if she described it out loud, she would stop seeing it over and over in her mind. But how could she explain? Where should she start? Her father was the first to interrupt the silence. I just don't understand this at all, he said in a voice she had seldom heard. If you and Chuck don't know anything about this, how could Chuck's fingerprints be on the knife? I, well... Dina could feel all of her horror welling inside her. She suddenly felt like a balloon about to burst. Well, what? her father asked impatiently. Dina couldn't hold it in any longer. Of course his fingerprints are on a knife, she screamed. But he didn't kill her. She was already dead. You've got to believe me. You've got to. Then she started to cry and couldn't stop. Calm down. Calm down, her mother said softly. We'll talk about this when we get home. Her father continued to drive, staring straight ahead through the windshield, his eyes hard and cold in the rearview mirror. Despite the hour, Jade came over as soon as Dina called her. Maybe the two of us can explain it to my parents, Dina said, opening the door for Jade. I don't think I can do it by myself. For once, Jade looked terrible. Her eyes were red. She was as pale as a ghost. The old sweater she had thrown on had a hole in it and a stain on one sleeve. Is Chuck really in jail? She whispered to Dina as they headed into the kitchen to face Dina's parents. Yes, he was 18 on his last birthday. That means I can try him as an adult. But he's innocent, Jade cried. What about bail? Can't your father get him out? There's no bail for murder suspects, Dina replied. Murder. She couldn't believe she was saying that word out loud. You've got to help me, Dina said, squeezing Jade's hand. You've got to help me convince my parents. They walked into the brightly lit kitchen. Mr. and Mrs. Martinson greeted Jay without smiling. Mrs. Martinson poured her a cup of coffee. Okay, you're both here, Mr. Martinson said, grim-faced. Begin at the beginning. Fighting back tears and sipping coffee with trembling hands, Dina and Jay told her parents everything. They started with the phone calls. They ended with their visit to Fear Street and the terrifying car chase that followed. For a long while after they had finished, Dina's parents didn't say anything. They contemplated the floor, shaking their heads. Do you mean to say that this whole thing began with a prank phone call, Mr. Morrison said at last. And it ended in a murder, Jade said sadly, her voice a whisper. But the two aren't connected, said Dina, sighing miserably. It was hard to believe that those silly calls to Rob Morrell and the others had started only two weeks earlier. It seemed more like two years. We didn't mean any harm, Mrs. Martinson, Jade said. It was just something to do, a fun way of putting on some of the boys at school. I just don't understand. Then how did Chuck get involved in it, asked Dina's mother. He happened to overhear one of our conversations, said Jade. And then he, uh, made some prank phone calls himself. But that isn't even how he happened to call the Farberson's number. What do you mean, asked Mr. Martinson. Well, you see, there is this bat, Dina said. A bat, cried her mother, exasperated. Dina, will you please try to make some sense? Dina sighed. She knew how lame the whole thing sounded. And if her parents wouldn't believe her, how could she expect the police to? It's obvious the girl is trying to protect her brother, Detective Monroe whispered to Detective Fraser, loud enough for Dina to hear. It was late Sunday afternoon. Dina and Jade had just told the whole story again from the beginning, but from the expressions on the detective's faces, it was obvious that they only believed parts of it the parts that seemed the worst for Chuck. Let's go over this again, said Detective Fraser. When did Chuck make the threatening phone calls? Before or after he made the bomb threat? You make it sound so terrible, said Dina, trying not to cry again, trying to maintain control. But it was just a prank, and he didn't make all that many calls. Even one bomb threat is a serious matter, observed Detective Fraser. And you say he used the name The Phantom of Fear Street. On one or two calls, said Dina. Someone using that name called 911 right after the break-in at the Farbersons, Fraser said. That was Chuck, said Jade. Why did he use that name, asked Fraser. If he hadn't done anything wrong, why didn't he say who he was? Because we've told you. Dina was so exasperated she felt like screaming. He was already in enough trouble. He'd been expelled from his old school. He'd gotten into that stupid fight in the cafeteria. A real model citizen, in other words, said Fraser sarcastically. Let's move on, said Detective Monroe, to the night of the murder. Now, you say that Chuck just happened to pick the Farberson's number out of the phone book at random? 
That's right, said Jade and Dina in unison. And he did this because you girls were scared of a bat. Disbelief showed on his face. Dina just nodded. No wonder the policeman didn't believe her. It all sounded crazy, even to her. And yet it was true. Then you kids decided to go over to Fear Street. Alone. We thought of calling the police, Jade said. But Chuck said you'd never believe us. And he was right, you don't. Uh-huh, said Detective Monroe. So you went over there and broke in the back door. The back door had already been broken into, said Dina. Right, said Monroe. And then he discovered the body of Mrs. Farverson. We didn't know who she was, said Dina. Chuck thought she might still be alive, Jade added. So he started to call for an ambulance, said Dina. And that's when your mythical masked man appeared, said Detective Frazier. He's not mythical, said Dina. He's real. He broke in and robbed the house. He stabbed Mrs. Farberson. He was still there when we arrived. Why aren't you out there searching for him instead of putting Chuck in jail? Farberson identified Chuck in a lineup this afternoon, said Monroe in a flat tone. Chuck's fingerprints were found on the murder weapon, said Frazier. No one else's. But we explained that, said Dina. When the man in the mask, oh, what's the use? She blinked back tears and stole a peek at Jade. Jade appeared to be every bit as upset as Dina felt. She looked slightly green, as if she were about to become sick. For a few moments, another policeman spoke. Then Monroe started in again. Can either of you explain to me why a burglar, let alone a murderer, would hang around when he heard three people enter the house? It doesn't make any sense, added Fraser. Why would he let you see him? Why wouldn't he hide somewhere till you left? Or try to escape without being seen? Why would he want to chase you, said Monroe, if he'd done the things you say, girls? He wouldn't be too interested in chasing after three teenagers in his car and then just driving away. We don't know why, Dina shouted, but everything we've told you is the truth. Detective Monroe sighed. Listen to me, Dina, Jade. Loyalty is wonderful. I try to teach it to my own kids, but loyalty is no virtue when it causes you to lie to protect someone bad. Now, we understand that you want to help Chuck, but this crazy story can't do him any good at all. It's not crazy, Dina said. It's true. Come on, girls, Detective Frazier said. This has to be hard on you. You can help Chuck most by telling us the truth. So please, think carefully and then tell us what really happened. Chapter 13 Sunday night, Dina couldn't get to sleep. The events of Saturday night and Sunday kept chasing through her mind. It was bad enough that the police didn't believe a word she and Jade had told them. Now she had to go to school and face her friends, who would all know that she and Jade and Chuck were mixed up in a murder. Monday morning, she met Jade in the parking lot before school. Jade was wearing a navy jumper with a fuzzy pink wool jacket. She was dressed like her old self. For once, however, her mouth wasn't turned up in a mischievous smile. She looked grim. Have you seen this? She said, handing Dina the morning paper. Dina opened it. There is a story, right at the top of page one. The headline, in bold black letters, said, Local teen charged in murder. Below that, in smaller type, was a subheadline. Eighteen-year-old suspect tied to phone threats. Her heart pounding, Dina began to read. Charles A. Martinson, the son of local telephone executive Albert B. Martinson, was arrested at his home early Sunday morning and charged with the stabbing murder Saturday night of Edna Lemley Farberson, 45. Mrs. Farberson, who moved to Shadyside only six months ago, was found by her husband, Stanley, 46, in their ransacked house at 884 Fear Street. According to police sources, Mrs. Farberson surprised the suspect as he was burglarizing the house. A struggle ensued, and Mrs. Farberson was killed with a 10-inch long knife that her husband identified as from their kitchen. Mr. Farberson told police that he arrived home as the suspect was fleeing. The moon was right above the house, so I got a good look at him and the license on his car, Farberson said. Farberson didn't pursue the intruder, but instead ran inside to check on the safety of his wife. Farberson had come home early from Alberga 3, a popular Italian restaurant that he owns and operates. Usually, I don't get home till after midnight, Farberson told the press, but Edna wouldn't answer the phone, and I got worried. I had a feeling something was wrong. The Martinson youth is being held without bail pending further investigation. Also arrested were two juvenile girls, who were later released to their parents' custody. According to police sources, the three teens are implicated in a number of threatening phone calls that have been made in the Shadeside area in recent weeks, including the bomb threat at Shadeside Lanes last Saturday night. These same sources report that Charles Martinson had identified himself as the Phantom of Fear Street in these calls, while the girls made anonymous suggestive calls to local boys. Dina finished reading the article, then reread it, hoping to find something different. Glumly, she handed it back to Jade. 
I'm not going to school today, she said, wishing she meant it. It's awful, isn't it, said Jade. But do you think anyone will know it's us? Who else, said Dina. Chuck's my brother, and everyone knows you and I hang out together. I just can't figure out how Farberson saw Chuck. We didn't see him. Dina, we are running for our lives, Jade answered. Then she looked at the paper again. It says we were both arrested, Jade said, but I wasn't even there. It doesn't matter, said Dina. The article makes everything look as bad as possible. People are only going to believe the worst. Like the police did, said Jade. Right, Dina agreed with a sigh. As Dina and Jade had feared, the only topic of conversation at school that day was Chuck and the murder. Chuck had only attended Shadyside for two weeks, so just a few kids knew him. But by second period, everyone in the school knew that he was Dina's brother, and that Dina and Jade were with him the night of the murder. But, strangely, no one seemed to blame the girls for anything. In fact, a lot of the kids seemed sympathetic. Dina was surprised in her first period class when Kathy Narita passed her a note. Don't worry, the note read. Chuck's in my geography class, and I'm sure he's innocent. Mostly, everyone was curious. They all wanted to know what had happened. Dina didn't know how Jade was handling it, but she tried to say as little as possible, while still seeming friendly. It got stickier when Lisa Bloom, assistant editor of the school newspaper, cornered Dina between second and third periods. I heard all about your brother, Lisa told Dina. Pretty rough. Yeah, said Dina. Thanks. I'm sure he's completely innocent, though, Lisa went on. Of course he is, said Dina. She started to push past Lisa and head for her next class, but Lisa put her hand on Dina's arm. By the way, she said casually, Everyone says you and Jade were with Chuck when it happened. The spectator would really love to do a feature on it. I'm sorry, said Dina, but the detectives told us not to talk about it. Don't you want to let people know your brother is innocent, said Lisa. Of course I do, said Dina, but but every time I try to help him, I end up making things worse. Please, Lisa, don't push me. Sorry, said Lisa, I understand, but maybe you could tell me a little bit about the other parts of it that don't have to do with the murder. What do you mean, said Dina? Well, what about the phone call, said Lisa. Dina felt her heart sink. It was just harmless fun, said Dina. It didn't have anything to do with the murder. Not really. Can you tell me the names of the people you called? No, said Dina. Then she smiled, hoping that she sounded casual. Honestly, the police told me not to say anything. It was no big deal, really. Now, excuse me, I've got to get to class. Me too, said Lisa. But when it's all over, will you give me an exclusive? Sure, Dina promised. If it's ever over, she thought. In trigonometry class, Dina was only half there while Mr. Spencer talked about sines, cosines, and tangents. All she could think about was what had happened Saturday night and the terrible trouble Chuck was in. Over and over, her thoughts came back to the large man in the mask. The burglar, the real killer. If she could find him somehow, then maybe the police would let Chuck go. How could she find him? Where would she begin? She was still thinking about the masked man after class when someone bumped into her, hard, in the hall. She raised her eyes, startled and annoyed to see Bobby McCory glaring down at her. Excuse me, she mumbled, even though he had bumped into her. She started to move on, but he stepped to the side, blocking her path. Now she could see that his two buddies, Eddie Mixon and Ralph Terry, were right behind him. Even more annoyed, Dina glared back at Bobby. What was wrong with him? He hardly knew her. In fact, they probably hadn't said three words to each other in their whole lives. And then she remembered. Bobby was the boy Chuck had fought with the first day of school. Even worse, he was the first one Chuck had called, claiming to be the Phantom of Fear Street. Will you let me get by, Dina said, trying to sound polite but firm. Sure, said Bobby, after you listen to me. All right, said Dina, trying to sound tough. I'm listening. I want you to give your brother a message, Dina, Bobby said. Tell the Phantom of Fear Street that if he ever gets out of jail, his troubles aren't over. Got that? Dina didn't answer. Just give him that message, Bobby repeated. Of course, he probably won't ever get out. In fact, he added in a nasty tone, according to the papers, he's guilty, and that means life in prison. A film of tears suddenly formed over her eyes, and she didn't even notice that Bobby had turned away and gone off down the hall, laughing with his two buddies. In a daze, Dina stumbled toward the lunchroom and got in line. Usually, she was one of the first ones there, because she liked to get eating over with to go outside on nice days, or to go to the library when it was cold or raining. But that day, she was nearly at the end of the line, she pointed at Randa to some things in the steam table, then took her loaded tray over to where Jade was sitting alone. I thought maybe you were staging a hunger strike, said Jade. I've almost finished eating already. If you're still hungry, you can have mine, said Dina. I don't have much appetite today. I know what you mean, said Jade. Nobody can talk about anything but the murder. And the phone calls, agreed Dina. She took a bite of some brown and green stuff on her plate and swallowed it without really tasting it. 
That reminds me, said Jade. I ran into Rob Morrell this morning. He asked me if I knew anything about some sexy phone calls he got. Ah, no, said Jade. You didn't tell him. All I told him was that I didn't call him, Jade said. But the paper said the two of us. As a matter of fact, I think he wants to discuss it with you, said Jade. Look, he's coming over here right now. Dina saw Rob Morrell, a friendly smile on his face, approaching with a tray in his hands. In a total panic, she stood up, desperate for a way to escape. Sit down, said Jade. You haven't eaten a thing. She pushed back her own chair. Sorry, I can't stay and talk to you guys, but I've got to return a library book. Jade, no, said Dina. It was too late. With a flash of her mischievous smile, Jade had turned and walked off. A moment later, Rob Morrell slid into the empty seat. Hi, Dina, he said. Hi, she mumbled. She sneaked a look at him. He didn't seem to be angry or upset or anything except friendly. I heard about your brother, he said. What a drag. He's innocent, said Dina. Well, sure he is, said Rob. I mean, I don't really know him, but he seems like a nice guy. Dina didn't answer. As always, when she was with boys, she couldn't think of anything to say. You know, Rob went on, I've been wanting to talk with you ever since we were in solid geometry together last year. Want to get together sometime? I guess so, said Dina, not believing what she was hearing. You're probably pretty busy till the trouble with your brother gets taken care of, said Rob. But I'll give you a call if that's all right. It's fine, said Dina. Great, said Rob, standing up. Somehow, I have an idea I'll like talking to you on the phone. Later that night, Dina tried to concentrate on her trig homework, but it was impossible. No matter how hard she tried to do a problem, her mind skipped the thoughts of Chuck or of Rob Morrell. In fact, Rob Morrell was the first thing she'd been able to think about, besides Chuck's trouble. What did he mean he wanted to talk to her on the phone? Did he know she'd made those calls? Did he think she was after his bod? Or maybe, did he just like her? After all, he had said he'd wanted to talk to her since solid geometry class. And, she remembered, he had smiled at her sometimes during class last year. Dina yawned and shut her trig book, then started to get ready for bed. When the phone rang, she jumped nervously before grabbing up the receiver. Hello? she said, hoping it was Rob. It was Jade, her voice excited and urgent. Dina, turn on your TV. Channel 7? Right now. And she hung up. Puzzled, Dina switched on the little set she kept beside her desk. It was the local news, and the reporter was interviewing a big man with a broken nose. There was something familiar about the man. Dina was sure she didn't know him, but she had a feeling that she had met him somewhere. What are your feelings about the suspect? The reporter was saying. I hope he gets the maximum, said the man in a deep, growling, strangely familiar voice. I know I'm supposed to turn the other cheek, but I can't forgive someone for such a terrible crime. Well, that about wraps it up here, said the reporter. Thank you, Mr. Farberson. Now, back to the studio. Dina stared at the television. Mr. Farberson. Now she knew where she had seen him before. She recognized his voice. Mr. Farberson was the man in the mask. Chapter 14 Dina called Jade back right away. Was that who I think it was? She said as soon as her friend answered. It's definitely him, said Jade. I'd never forget that voice. Me neither, agreed Dina. I think we ought to tell the police. Oh, sure, said Jade. They didn't believe a word we said. And if they didn't believe us before, what makes you think they'll believe us now? They'll probably just think we're desperate, which we are. But it was him, Jade, said Dina. I'm going to call Detective Fraser first thing in the morning. Lots of luck, said Jade, especially since the police don't even believe there was a masked man. Well, we saw him, said Dina. If it was Mr. Farberson, that means he broke into his own house. And murdered his own wife, Jade added in a soft voice. Why would he do such a thing, said Dina. I don't know, said Jade. There must have been a reason. Dina sat thinking for a moment, wondering what reason anyone could possibly have for committing such a terrible crime. Maybe he and Mrs. Farberson had a big fight, she said finally. Maybe, agreed Jade. And maybe he killed her during the fight. But why would he break into the house? It doesn't make any sense. Wait a minute, said Dina. What if that's the reason he did it? Huh? said Jade. You lost me on that last turn. Well, what if he broke into the house to make it look as if a burglar did it? What if it was all part of the plan to kill his wife? Jade was solemn for a moment. I see what you mean, she said, but why would he want to kill her? I don't know, said Dina, but I'm sure the police can find out, and then they'll have to let Chuck go. I guess so, Jade said doubtfully. Sure they will. You'll see. And then we can forget about this whole thing and start living normal lives again. If the police listen to me, she thought, and somehow she didn't feel as sure of that as she sounded. Now, let me get this straight, Detective Fraser said slowly. It was early the next morning, and Dina had intended to leave the detective a message, but he had answered his own phone. 
You and your friend both contend that the masked man you claim to have seen at the Farberson's place was actually Mr. Farberson, Fraser went on. We're positive, said Dina. When we saw him on TV last night, we both knew, instantly from his voice. It couldn't be anyone else. His voice, Fraser repeated dryly. And since it was him, Dina went on, ignoring the detective's lack of response. That means he did it, broke into the house, and killed his own wife. Does your voice analysis tell you why Mr. Farberson allegedly committed these crimes? asked Fraser. I don't know. Maybe his wife had a big insurance policy, said Dina. Or maybe they just had a fight. I'm sure you can find out. You are, are you? said the detective. He was silent a moment, then he sighed. That's an interesting story you've dreamed up, he said. But that's all it is, a story. For your information, Mr. Farberson is a respected businessman in this town. I understand your desire to divert suspicion from your brother, but we're not buying all tall tales today. Dina hung up the phone, feeling sick. Jade had been right. The police wouldn't listen to them. That meant it was up to her and Jade to prove that Mr. Farberson was the masked man. But how? She yawned and finished getting ready for school before calling Jade. What are we going to do? She asked with a sigh, when she had finished telling her friend what the detective had said. I'm not sure, said Jade. Meet me at my locker before lunch? I think I'm getting an idea. Just before lunch, Dina found Jade, bent over her locker, stuffing two huge boxes into the tiny space. Hi, Jade said, looking up. We definitely ought to campaign for bigger lockers. What in the world have you gotten there? said Dina. Props, said Jade. Props? Jade managed to get the locker door shut and clicked her lock on it then looked up at Dina with her familiar mischievous smile. Jade, Dina thought, was definitely up to something, but what? Jade went right on, sounding excited and pleased. Right after we talked this morning, I reread the piece in the Shayside Press, she said. I never want to see that again, said Dina. It's the worst newspaper article I've ever read. It's full of information about Mr. and Mrs. Farberson, though, said Jade. For instance, it says that he owns and operates the Alberger 3. So, said Dina. So, said Jade. What better place to find out more about Mr. Farberson than the place where he works? You mean, go into the alberga and talk to him, said Dina. Are you crazy? Some people think so, said Jade, but this idea is smart. Look, Dina, he's the owner and manager. The article said he came home early Saturday night. That means he's probably not there during the day. I'm beginning to catch on, said Dina. Right, said Jade. We'll drive over there right after school gets out. My dad's out of town, so I have the vet. We'll just poke around, see if we can find out anything. I don't know, said Dina. It still sounds kind of dangerous. What if he comes in early? Don't forget he knows who we are. True, said Jade. But he thinks I'm a redhead with long hair, and you're a blonde with a layered cut. We are, said Dina, beginning to feel exasperated. But we won't be this afternoon, said Jade. She gestured toward her clothes locker. I stopped by my mother's beauty shop this morning before school and borrowed a couple of wigs. I told her we needed them for a drama club production. She smiled impishly. Believe me, Dina, even our own parents won't know us, let alone Farberson. Dina met Jade in the drama club room after school. She had left a message for her parents that she had to go to the library. Squinting into the brightly lit makeup mirror, the girls put on the wigs and extra makeup. When they had finished, Dina thought they both looked great. Jade was now blonde with a bubble cut and a green eye shadow, while Dina had curly auburn hair and a frizz. Jade dotted a beauty mark on Dina's cheek with an eyebrow pencil. We both look at least 18 now, said Jade. Come on, this will be a snap. The Burger 3 was a few miles away, in the old village. Jade had never been in it, but knew her parents ate there sometimes. Despite the disguises, Dina felt a nervous knot beginning to grow in her stomach as Jade pulled her red Corvette into the parking place right in front of the Burger. I don't know, Jade, she said. Maybe this isn't such a good idea. Listen, said Jade. We have no choice. No one will believe us. We've got to get Chuck out of this mess. Now just follow my lead. The Alberga 3 wasn't open for lunch, so the dining room was nearly empty. It was dark and cool looking, with big booths and banquets covered in a dark, velvety cloth. On one wall was a large mural of Italy, and candles burned in glass holders at each table. Let's just order a pepperoni pizza to go, Dina cracked to break the tension. Get real, said Jade. Now remember, keep your mouth shut and let me do the talking. After a moment, a tall, dark-haired woman came over to greet them. She was dressed in a white silk blouse and calf-length green skirt. She was as elegant as the restaurant. May I help you? she asked. We're here to apply for jobs, said Jade. The woman looked at the girls, not hiding her surprise. Did the agency send you? she said. That's right, said Jade. But there's only one opening, the woman objected. Mr. Farberson can't use more than one assistant. I'm the one applying, said Jade. My friend just came along to keep me company. 
I thought you said, oh, never mind, said the tall woman. You look a little young, but we're fairly desperate since Miss Morrison quit last week. You do take dictation and do bookkeeping? Absolutely, said Jade. Then come with me, said the woman. You can fill out the forms in the office. Jade turned and winked at Tina. Then both girls followed the tall woman through the restaurant kitchen into a small corridor. The woman knocked on a closed door, then called, Mr. Farmerson. I thought he worked at night, said Jade in a panic-sounding voice. He has to get an early start, said the woman. In fact, that's one reason we need an assistant at night. She knocked again. Dina and Jade exchanged a quick glance. Dina got ready to turn and run in the opposite direction, but before she could do anything, the door opened. There stood the man with a broken nose, the man identified on television as Mr. Farberson, the man that both Dina and Jade knew was the masked man. Yeah, he said in his low voice. One of these young women is here to apply for Linda's job, said the woman. The agency sent her. Oh, yeah, said Mr. Farberson. He looked at Jade, hard, then turned and looked at Dina. Dina felt as if her heart had stopped beating. Farberson took his time looking both girls up and down. Then he spoke again. How old are you girls, he said. I'm 19, said Jade. I have a business certificate from the commercial school. Oh, yeah, said Farberson. Dina was beginning to find his limited vocabulary annoying. Well, you might as well fill out an application, he said. Dina began breathing again. Just have a seat, Farberson said, indicating two battered folding chairs. He thrust an application form at Jade. Fill this out, he said. I'll be back in a few minutes. He turned to the tall woman. Come on, Katie, he said. Let's check the wine inventory before Ernie gets here. Mr. Farberson and the tall woman left the office, shutting the door. Dina and Jay glanced at each other. I don't believe it, Dina said. Believe it, said Jay. Now quick, we don't have much time. Quickly, she scurried behind Mr. Farberson's large, littered wooden desk. Dina followed her. What are we looking for, she said. I don't know, said Jade. anything, especially anything that tells us more about Mr. Farberson. What a mess, Dina said, looking at the clutter of papers. Almost at random, she picked one up. Here's a work schedule, she said. Jade turned to look at it. According to this, Mr. Farberson only works every other Saturday night, she said. That means he was off last Saturday. That's interesting, but doesn't really prove anything, said Dina. Jade, this is hopeless. What do you think we... Shush, said Jade. Just keep looking. Both girls continued picking up papers, glancing at them, and putting them down as neatly as possible. So Farberson couldn't tell that they had gone through the desk. Nothing either of them found seemed to have anything to do with Mr. Farberson or his wife. Dina glanced at her watch. They'd been there for almost ten minutes. Jade frowned and started to open the drawers one by one. Hurry, said Dina. He might come back any minute. I know, said Jade. But I just want to find... Wait a minute. I have an idea. I hope it's a fast one, said Dina. Whenever my mother wants to hide something, like the extra car keys, she tapes them to the underside of a drawer... She began pulling the drawers out again and feeling along the undersides with her fingers. Hurry, whispered Dina, wondering how old you had to be to have a heart attack. Jade searched the undersides of all but one drawer. Dina heard a sound in the hall, then the muffled voice of Mr. Farberson calling something to someone named Ernie. Jade! Aha, said Jade. She had her hand under the drawer. Wait a minute, I think I've found something. Her expression changed quickly from triumph to defeat. Just a wad of chewing gum. Shaking her head sadly. She started to close the desk drawer when a sealed envelope caught her eye. It was from the Shadyside Travel Agency. She picked it up to examine it when the office door started to open. Jade shoved the envelope into a pocket and scurried across the stained carpet to her chair, just as Mr. Farberson entered the room. Dina forced herself to look at his face and felt called all over. All right, girls, Mr. Farberson growled, his face frozen in a mask of anger. Let's stop playing games. I knew the truth as soon as I saw you.